Former Vice President Mike Pence sat down with Face the Nation moderator and chief foreign affairs correspondent Margaret Brennan today for a wide-ranging interview on the heels of his former boss's announcement of a run for president. Margaret began by asking him about that announcement and what it might mean for Pence's own likely run for the White House. You know, having seen what you saw up close for four years, do you think there is a danger in Donald Trump being president again? President Trump was not only my president, but he was my friend. We worked very closely to create a record of prosperity at home, seven million good paying jobs. We rebuilt our military. We saw more than 300 conservatives appointed to our courts. We took down the ISIS caliphate. Uh, we brought about peace uh, in the Middle East. Um, but obviously it didn't end well. And uh, uh, while the president and I parted amicably, I. Uh, uh, I believe, as we look to the future, that we'll have better choices. Uh, you talk about moving forward. Um, the idea of relitigating the 2020 election continues to circulate, as you know that, uh, amongst members of your party. Homeland Security is warning of the risk of political violence, and they have drawn a direct line between domestic violent extremism and this false belief that the 2020 election was somehow rigged. Do you think that continuing to push these claims, as the former president does, is a direct threat? The 2020 election was not stolen. Uh, we have a process in this country where states conduct elections. Uh, questions of irregularities or fraud are then adjudicated in the courts. The states then certify electoral votes. And as we did on January 6th, in the wake of that terrible violence. Um, the role of the Congress is to open and count those votes and to certify the election. We did that. Mm -hmm. And Joe Biden was elected president of the United States of America. But I do think there's been far too much talk uh, questioning the integrity of our elections. I'm all for election reform. I'm glad to see states around the country that are strengthening election integrity. Because the truth is there were irregularities in the election, even where there wasn't ever evidence of widespread fraud. For more, Margaret Brennan joins us now from our Studio 57 in New York City. And CBS News senior White House and political correspondent Ed O'Keefe joins me here at the desk. Great to have you both. Uh, Margaret, great interview. I want to start with you. Um, it was Fascinating to hear Mike Pence acknowledge that the administration did not end well. This after he's trying to tout the successes that he sees from the administration. Presumably, he's talking about January 6th. Um, and I'm curious, uh, you know, you, I think you asked him whether he would, in fact, testify in some form to the January 6th committee. I want to play a little bit of what he had to say and get your thoughts on the other side. Congress has no right to my testimony. We have a separation of powers under the Constitution of the United States. Um, and I believe it would establish a terrible precedent uh, for the Congress to summon a vice president of the United States to speak about deliberations that took place uh, at the White House. So and, you're, uh, you're closing the door on that entirely. Um, I'm closing the door on that. And, uh, but I must say again that the partisan nature of the January 6th committee uh, has been a disappointment to me. So, Margaret, the former vice president making some news there, closing the door, it seems. Yes, uh, I think you can call it a euphemism to say that the administration ended, didn't end well. Uh, that is a reference to the violence on January 6th. And here you are hearing uh, Mike Pence, the former vice president, try to do something that's going to be increasingly challenging for him to do if he does decide to run for the presidency, which is to both brag about the achievements of the administration, but then tried to separate himself from the man who was president at the top of the <clears throat> ticket. Um, and yeah. you hear him trying to navigate that just in his answer to me, touting their wins, but then acknowledging how wrong, unconstitutional, flawed, illegal. I mean, these are all words he used in, in the course of our conversation. And yet, as you just point out there, doesn't want to go sit and answer questions before the January 6th committee, um, raising procedural and process issues with the makeup of that committee. So this is, again, trying to thread that really difficult political um, needle here of, of both appealing to supporters of the prior administration without alienating them by being too harshly critical of former President Trump.
Yeah, Margaret, that's such a good point because I think that's something that a lot of these uh, potential candidates are trying to grapple with. I mean, you had Mike Pompeo, Ed, today tweeting, uh, presumably kind of subtweeting the former president, saying we need more serious, less, n more seriousness, less noise, and leaders who are looking forward, not staring in the rearview mirror, claiming victimhood. So you do have, you know, you have Mike Pence out there talking, mm -hmm. you have Pompeo, you have some others. A lot of these people were also closely in Trump's orbit. Is the White House, from your perspective, kind of just taking a step back and looking at all of this and, and letting all of this play out, or are they feeling a need to get engaged? They engaged a little bit last night. I mean, it was notable that just as the former president was preparing to take the stage, the uh, president's personal or political uh, Twitter account, for example, put out a little video that was produced by the Democratic National Committee, sort of setting up a rhetoric versus results mm. uh, argument between the current and former president. He talked a lot about doing things. We're actually getting them done. Uh, mm -hmm. So that kind of thing, I think, is, is something we'll see more of. Uh, otherwise, they're just sort of preparing to hang back, continue to do their job with Washington, however Washington is run in the new mm -hmm. year, uh, and, and argue that it's Democrats trying to, you know, do things to help Americans and to find consensus in the middle, while Republicans may be running around mm -hmm. uh, doing or saying things that run counter to that. But uh, make no mistake, they're ready to, uh, you know, run against Trump again if it's him, and they are preparing mm -hmm. both at the White House and the Democratic National Committee for any number of other Republican contenders, whether it's the former Vice President Pence, the former Secretary of State, Ron mm -hmm. DeSantis, mm -hmm. Larry Hogan, whoever, they've, yeah. uh, they've been preparing the opposition research and, and getting ready for whoever it may be. Yeah, and, and Margaret, as all of this jockeying is going around, something that has stood out to me from Pence over the past few months is that he is engaging on some of these social issues that other Republicans have kind of shied away from. I mean, namely the issue of abortion. Um, he was one of the few Republicans out there on the campaign trail kind of really leaning in to celebrate the, the overturning of Roe. I'm, I'm wondering if he talked about any of that in, in your interview. And of course, also the Senate, of course, is um, supposed to vote tonight on the Defense of Marriage Act. Right. Um, is, is this something that he has been, been talking about? Well, I made a point, Caitlin, to, to bring those issues up to him because, you know, I've covered Mike Pence a long time, um, and this is foundational to who he is, his identity of being um, an evangelical Christian, and that he views these issues that you just called social issues purely as moral issues from his mm. perspective. And so um, I did raise the point because I was struck in the book that Mike Pence just wrote about his family that he notes his wife had to undergo IVF treatment, fertility treatment, because she had such a difficult time getting mm. pregnant five times. And anyone who knows anything about that knows how taxing that is as a family. And I said, you know, the, one of the concerns yeah. after Roe versus Wade is will there be restrictions? Because if you believe life begins at conception, what about fertility treatments? Will they be impacted and restricted? And he did say, it made a huge difference to his family, and he thought there should be protections in the law. I think it's so interesting, mm. and Caitlin, you know this so well, like the details, when you try to pin people down on um, abortion or issues around uh, women's health, they, they know that it gets a little bit more complicated when you speak in personal terms. Also that it was interesting that while he has said he supports the Rubio-Graham bill that would uh, restrict abortion access after 15 weeks, um, that... That's just a starting point for him. He wants mm. there to be, uh, as he said, state by state, uh, protection of life. In other words, a ban, a full ban. He thinks that's the, the moral arc of this argument. That's how he frames it, and that's going to be interesting to see because one of the things we learned from these midterm races was how powerful abortion access is at mobilizing people and how politically toxic it potentially was for the Republican Party. So... Another one of these things that uh, Republicans will have to uh, figure out um, as they try to reshape the party. And does it have this part of evangelical Christianity that is so central to who Mike Pence is? Yeah, that's such a great point, Margaret, because I have been wondering through all of this, Ed, what is Mike Pence's constituency? I mean, hmm. now that he is out, you know, kind of uh, Trump doesn't like him very much, to say the least. Um, where does he find his lane of support? I mean, to Margaret's point, he, that's why he's trying to kind of thread the needle here. Right, and that this is part of why there are many who believe he may want to run, but it's unclear whether he could ever really get things off the ground. Mm -hmm. Okay, you want to be the social conservative candidate, great. 
where does that work for you in the Republican Party, though, outside of Iowa and South Carolina? It may not now in a post-Roe world where even senators today will tell you they know that these issues of same-sex marriage, abortion rights and whatnot mm -hmm. resonate, need to be addressed and talked about in a way that is seen as more, uh, you know, open to, if not compromise, at least acknowledging that there are some who feel mm -hmm. differently than many base voter Republicans. Uh, and, you know, he, he has to... His wager would be that the Republican base peels away from the former president little by little and sees him as a better option. The question is, can he stand up an operation that would sustain itself through that mm, yeah. uh, when others are also doing it, uh, who may be seen as newer, younger, more vibrant, more engaging? Uh, mm -hmm. And that's, uh, that's part of the, the tricky nature of this. And, you know... He, there are multiple former Trump administration officials doing this. Yeah. There are multiple January 6th proponents or mm -hmm. opponents who are doing this. And he enters a crowded space conceivably. Absolutely. And with Mitch McConnell today saying that they are not doing well among independent right. and uh, moderate Republicans and, and suburban voters. That is a challenge. Yeah. Um, Ed O'Keefe and Margaret Brennan, thank you so much. We'll have much more of your interview tonight, tomorrow, and of course on Face the Nation. Thank you for sharing a little bit with us uh, today. We appreciate it.